supplied by the manufacturer, information that you need to know, that's labeling. Uh, target, the site or pest toward which control measures are being directed. And a new term, uh, rinsate, up near the top of this block. Rin, uh, pesticide containing water or other liquid that results from rinsing a pesticide container. When you try to get all of that pesticide out and you put a little extra water in there and shake it up, that's called the rinsate. And in many cases, you can rinse, use the rinsate in your next uh, spray or in your next treatment, if the label allows it. So you need to look at the label to be sure you can actually use the rinsate in your next spray mix. The purpose, of course, the rinsate is to clean the container so we can then recycle or reuse that container possibly again. But that is rinsate, target, and labeling. Special environmental concerns, protecting groundwater and endangered species. Pesticide use is causing increasing environmental concerns over protection of groundwater and protection of endangered species. Many people get their drinking water directly from groundwater. We must never allow it to be contaminated with anything harmful. What is groundwater? Groundwater is the water located below the Earth's surface among the layers of rock and soil. Groundwater moves slowly, sometimes only a few feet a year. It seeps down through cracks in rocks or between particles of sand, clay, or gravel. Groundwater in sufficient quantities to supply a well or a spring is called an aquifer. Much of our drinking water in North Georgia comes from surface water. South Georgia has been blessed with several large aquifers that are the major source of drinking water in this part of the state. Note the high well yields from South Georgia. This shows where the greatest amounts of pesticide are used in Georgia in our richest agricultural areas and right on top of our major aquifers. Here is a diagram showing the top of the soil surface, the actual groundwater in an aquifer, and the water table. The water table is the depth below which the ground is saturated with water. Note the level of water in the well begins at the same level as the water table. Groundwater is replaced or recharged mostly from rain or snow that enters the soil, but some comes from lakes, streams, and irrigation. Will pesticides reach groundwater? It depends on five major factors. The first factor is how you use the pesticide. Avoid the temptation to mix more pesticide than the labeling directs. Besides increasing costs, overdosing will increase the risks of reaching groundwater. Overdosing is also illegal. Avoid back siphoning. Never immerse a water hose in a spray tank. Leave an air gap, as shown on the right of the slide, so that if there is a negative pressure, pesticide cannot be sucked out of the spray tank and into the source of the water. Mixing and loading sites should be at least 100 feet from surface water or wells, and spillage should be avoided in all locations. Improper disposal of rinse water unused pesticide and pesticide containers can contaminate groundwater. A second factor affecting whether pesticides will reach groundwater is the amount of water on the treated surface. If there is more water on the soil than the soil can hold, the water along with any pesticides it contains is likely to move downward to the groundwater. Excessive rain or irrigation following pesticide applications can contribute to carrying pesticides to groundwater. Chemigation, the application of pesticides through an irrigation system, must be done with caution to avoid allowing pesticides to reach groundwater. A third factor is the chemical makeup of the pesticide. Pesticides that have a high solubility in water are more likely to be carried down into the groundwater, as shown on the left. Some pesticides are strongly adsorbed by soil particles and are less likely to move into the groundwater, as shown on the right. Pesticides that break down slowly, referred to as having a high persistence, are more likely to be a hazard in contaminating groundwater. 
A fourth factor is the soil type. If a soil is fine textured, such as clay, or contains plant roots or other organic matter, it will slow movement of water and pesticides. But if the soil is sandy and coarse, it probably will allow pesticides and water to move down rapidly. Note that the sandy soils of Georgia are located in the same areas where we have our major aquifers and major pesticide use. The fifth and final factor affecting whether pesticides reach groundwater is where the groundwater is located. How close to the surface is the groundwater? If the water is within a few feet of the soil surface, pesticides are more likely to reach it than if it is farther down. Here is a well located in sandy soil where the groundwater is very close to the soil surface. Poor pesticide handling practices could result in well contamination. This shows various geological conditions that can increase the potential for groundwater contamination. Improper construction of a well by failing to grout around the bore casing and install an adequate cement pad around the well can lead pesticides directly into the groundwater. We will now look at protection of endangered species of plants and animals from pesticides. Shown here is the endangered wood stork. It was once common, but is now confined mainly to wetlands in Georgia and Florida. An endangered species is a plant or animal that is in danger of becoming extinct, such as the bald eagle. Why are endangered plants important to us? At the present time, 90% of the world's food supply comes from less than 20 species of plants out of about 80,000 total edible species. Many of the species not currently used might be developed into an important food source or improve the genes of existing food sources. What gene combinations in the endangered hairy rattleweed shown here, a member of the bean family from southeast Georgia, could be used in improving soybeans? Nearly 25% of all prescription medicines have active ingredients derived from plants. How many more? or better medicines might be developed with ingredients from plants not yet researched for medicinal value. Only 15% of the plant species of Earth have been examined for anti-cancer properties. Such properties have been found in the Western Pacific U, A closely related species that is being examined for cancer-fighting chemicals is our endangered torea tree, shown here from southwestern Georgia. The Endangered Species Act of 1973 not only gives protection to endangered plants and animals, but requires that the EPA ensure that no pesticide usage will put an endangered species in jeopardy. The area of land, water, and air that an endangered species must have for survival is called its habitat, or critical habitat. A pesticide may have use restrictions if you are using it within the current habitat of an endangered plant or animal, and if the endangered species might be harmed by the pesticide. As with other types of precautions, the label may not tell you all you need to know. The label may refer you to other labeling information. Pesticides can harm endangered species by killing plants or animals directly disrupting or destroying their food or shelter, contaminating their air or water by wind drift or water runoff, or contaminating the food chain. Such contamination can build up to levels particularly dangerous to predators at the top of the chain. Pesticides bring many benefits. When you fulfill your responsibility by protecting critical parts of the environment, such as groundwater and endangered species, you help ensure that the benefits of pesticide use outweigh the risks. Okay, now we'll take a look at Chapter 5, Special Environmental Concerns. Chapter 4 was Environmental Concerns, but now we've got a couple of special uh, environmental concerns, specifically groundwater and endangered species. And they may ask you on the test, what is groundwater? And that's mentioned in the book in the very first uh, 
Well, under protecting groundwater, the first sentence there, groundwater is located beneath the Earth's surface as opposed to surface water, Chattahoochee River, Lake Lanier, Lake Alatoona, surface water, groundwater beneath the surface. And when you have enough groundwater located beneath the surface that, that might even provide uh, a well, water to a well, for instance, or a spring, it's called an aquifer. And you remember on the map down in central and south Georgia where we had a number of large aquifers, aquifers or aquifers, and that's where a lot of our, our large ag production, row crop production occurs is right on the top of those aquifers or aquifers. And we also have aquifers up here in North Georgia too. But just remember, an aquifer is that large pool of water located beneath the surface, okay? The water table, what is that? That's on page four, uh, left column up near the top. That's the dividing line between groundwater and the unsaturated rock or dry soil above that water. That's the, the water table. And sometimes it's a very shallow water table. Sometimes it's a, a deep water table. If it's shallow, then we have more of a potential to get pesticides or products down into that groundwater if we have a, a shallow um, water table. Also in this chapter, they give you, um, there are five points here listed on page four under pesticide contamination of groundwater. You might think, well, exactly how would a pesticide get into the groundwater? If I'm real careful and uh, uh, go by the label and labeling, how would that happen anyway? So if you five major factors that might determine whether a pesticide would even get into the groundwater, number one, the practices followed by the pesticide user. That's you. Are you sloppy with it? Do you just spill it all over the ground? Do you overdose and do, are you careless with the product, basically? Number one, the practices followed by the pesticide user. If you're careful, uh, no problems. If you're not careful, spills, accidents, uh, pesticide on the ground, somehow another, problems. Number two, the presence or absence of water on the surface of the site where the pesticides are released. If you already have water present on the surface and a pesticide gets into that water on the surface, then it can move uh, more readily down into the groundwater below the surface water. Number three, the chemical characteristics of the pesticide. What does that mean? Some pesticides are very soluble. They get in water, Bing, they're soluble instantly. So they can, they can get into the groundwater by, being, by the nature of just being highly, highly uh, soluble. The type of soil that you're dealing with where you're using pesticides. If it's a clay soil or high organic soil, a lot of times the clay and organic matter will tie up or lock the pesticide. What if it's more of a sandy soil, a loamy type? Wouldn't you think the pesticide would move down Okay, so the type of soil, if it's more of a sandy type or a loam type um, that the pesticide might move in the water down into the groundwater. And then, as we mentioned, the location of the groundwater, it's distance from the surface, if it's shallow or if it's deep. So those are just some of the factors that might determine whether a pesticide would even get into the groundwater. The best way to keep from contaminating groundwater is to follow label directions exactly. That might pop up on the test. That's just a little comment, and there's several of these that will pop up now from the rest of the, the chapter's own. The best way to keep from contaminating groundwater is to follow all label and labeling uh, exactly. Over on page five, speaking of odd statements, there's a little, there are three or four of these now that I'll mention to you, and usually they pop up on the test. But right under this diagram here on page five, there's a, there's a heading called rain. If you have your book, you may see the rain statement. And this usually pops up on the test, rain. If weather forecast or your own knowledge of local weather conditions or signs cause you to expect heavy rain, then, out, then delay outdoor handling operations, such as mixing, loading, application, et cetera. So if you watch the Weather Channel or Ken Cook or whatever, WMAZ, wherever you're from, Macon, Savannah, Columbus, whatever, or listen to the radio and a squall is approaching a front and you know you're gonna have rain, one, you know the pesticide's probably gonna wash or dilute, so you've wasted your time anyway, in many cases, but then your chances of that pesticide being flushed down into the groundwater are greatly enhanced. So remember that, if weather forecasts or your own knowledge of weather indicate approaching fronts, weather, rain, et cetera, delay outdoor handling processes. That'll probably be on the test, okay? We talked about uh, some of the major factors that might determine whether a pesticide could get into the groundwater. Several of these are, are, are linked back to the pesticide itself, and that's, that's uh, 
listed for you over here on page five, the solubility of that particular pesticide, the absorption uh, characteristics of that particular pesticide, is, can it easily become absorbed to a soil and become locked, or is it not, uh, does it not have those properties? And the persistence of that pesticide, does it persist for a long, long time before it breaks down? If so, you've got a greater risk of that pesticide moving or leaching down into the groundwater. So it's solubility, it's absorption characteristics onto the soil particles, and then it's persistence, just how long does it last? Over on page six, they talk about not the pesticide characteristics, but the soil characteristics that might determine whether a pesticide could get into the groundwater. The soil characteristics, the nature of the soil itself. Number one, the texture, the sand, silt, clay. And we've already mentioned if it's high silt or clay or organic matter, it might tend to lock that pesticide up. But if it's uh, loamy or sandy, it can move through quickly. Soil permeability, that's number two. Just a general flow of how fast water can move through a soil, like a perk test. Some soils perk quickly. Pesticides could move down quickly. And then the amount of soil organic matter. The higher the organic matter, usually the, the tighter a pesticide can be held or locked in that soil due to the organic content. Unfortunately, our soils around here aren't very high in organic matter unless we amend it and put in a lot of organic matter. But just, just native red clay is uh, not very high in organic matter. It does have a lot of clay and silt content, so it might help lock a pesticide there a little bit and play into our advantage in that respect. Also, protection of endangered species. This is the second portion of this chapter we wanted to cover. What is an endangered species? They'll probably ask you that on the test. That is a plant or animal, could be either, that is in danger of becoming extinct. They may ask you, what is a critical habitat as it pertains to endangered species? What is a critical habitat or what is a habitat? That is an area of land, usually land, but it could be water or air that an endangered species needs for survival. And as we pay, spray pesticides or apply pesticides, we, have, we impact critical habitats sometimes of endangered species. And then we determine whether that species might make it or may not make it. So do keep that in mind. Uh, on page eight, the term biological diversity is mentioned up in the right column, top right column. They might ask you, uh, what is biological diversity? That's the variety and differences among living things and the complex ways that we react. In simple terms, you know, we need trees, we need plants for oxygen, ocean, plankton in the oceans, uh, plants need us, so everything works together. And sometimes when we disrupt these patterns, this biological diversity, we have some problems. Um, but anyway, that's a definition of biological diversity. And with that, again, test your knowledge is at the end of each chapter, and these are some questions that you can look at over lunch or during the break if you want to, and that will kind of review what we've talked about in some of these chapters. And if we go back to the beginning on the terms to know, drift, pesticide movement away from the release site via the air or wind currents, groundwater, water located beneath the surface of the soil, down in the rock or down in the lower strata, stratum of the soil, Leaching, the movement of pesticide in water, usually, or other liquid down through the soil. That's leaching. Runoff is movement along the surface. Just about guarantee you'll see that later today. Surface water, water on top of the earth's surface, lakes, streams, etc. And one new term, there's always a, a new one in here uh, for us to look at, think about, called back siphoning. This is the very first term in the chapter back siphoning, movement of a liquid pesticide mixture back through the main filling hose and into the water source itself. And we have certain devices that we can attach or utilize, anti-siphoning devices, backflow preventers, etc., that will help stop or stop back siphoning, where with negative pressures, the pesticide is actually pulled back into a main water supply and that we contaminate the water supply and then we have some problems if we drink that water. Okay, well, we're moving along quite quickly here. The first five chapters now, we've talked just about a basic, um, the basics of pesticides, uh, a little bit about formulations, active ingredients, harm, uh, those type topics. Now with chapter six, we get in, we're getting more and deeper now into the, of what we're here today to talk about, 
harmful effects, this is really kind of the way direction we're headed, harmful effects on emergency responses. Hopefully nothing will ever go wrong with using a pesticide, but sometimes things do go wrong and we have harmful effects. So if you'll turn over to page or chapter six, uh, we'll take a look at harmful effects on emergency response. Harmful effects and emergency response. Most pesticides are designed to harm or kill pests. Many of them can also harm or kill humans if not used properly. You can avoid these harmful effects of pesticides if you use them correctly and avoid or minimize exposure. Hazard is the risk of harmful effects due to toxicity of the pesticide and the exposure of your body to the chemical. Remember your hazard or risk will be the result of the toxicity of the pesticide, the amount you're exposed to, and the length of time of the exposure. How are you exposed to pesticides? The four human exposure routes are oral, dermal, inhalation, and ocular. Inhalation exposures are often caused by prolonged contact in closed spaces, breathing vapors from fumigants, or breathing vapors, dust or mist, without proper respiratory equipment. Oral exposures are often caused by not washing hands before eating, drinking, or smoking, mistaking a pesticide for food or drink, or splashing pesticide into the mouth through carelessness or accident. Dermal exposures are often caused by not washing hands after handling pesticides, splashing or spraying pesticides on unprotected skin, or wearing inadequate personal protective equipment. Ocular or eye exposure is often caused by splashing or spraying pesticides in the eyes, rubbing eyes with contaminated gloves or hands, or handling dust or granule formulation without eye protection. Pesticides can harm you three ways. Acute toxicity is usually immediate, less than 24 hours, from contact with an amount of a pesticide that causes an obvious harmful effect, a toxic dose. Delayed toxicity, sometimes called chronic toxicity, is usually from pesticide exposure over a long period of time in repeated doses. And allergic toxicity happens to people whose bodies are sensitive to a chemical when the same amount of that chemical would not apparently cause problems for other people. This slide reviews some of the acute toxicity effects depending upon the route of entry. This is a worker being acutely exposed to a pesticide concentrate from a broken hose from a supply tank. Pesticides can damage the skin or eyes or pass through the skin to cause harm in other parts of the body. These are severe chemical burns caused when liquid-proof boots were not worn. Some pesticides can cause acute eye irritation or blindness if they get into the eye. Typical precautionary statements for acute toxicity on pesticide labeling are may be fatal if swallowed, harmful or fatal if absorbed through skin, or causes severe eye burns or blindness. Delayed effects, also called chronic effects, may occur days, months, or years after repeated exposure. In just a few days, exposure to some pesticides can lower the cholinesterase, which controls the nervous system causing illness or death. Repeated exposure risks over months or years are usually evaluated through studies done on laboratory animals. Some of these delayed effects include tumors, gene defects, miscarriage, impotence, birth defects, infertility, sterility, and nervous system disorders. A typical precautionary statement about delayed effects on a pesticide label may be, note, this product has been shown to cause cancer in laboratory animals, or this product has been determined to cause birth defects in laboratory animals. Allergic reactions to pesticides may take the form of systemic distress, such as asthma, skin irritation, 
such as rash, blisters, sores, or eye and nose problems such as itchy, watery eyes. A typical precautionary statement about allergies on a pesticide label may be, the active ingredient may cause skin sensitization reactions in certain individuals. Pesticide poisoning is caused by pesticides that harm internal organs or other systems inside the body. Symptoms of pesticide poisoning may include blurred vision, diarrhea, dizziness, excessive sweating, fatigue, headache, vomiting, and stomach cramps. Pesticide-related injuries usually are caused by pesticides that are external irritants. Poisoning by some pesticide chemical families results in distinctive signs that help others recognize the cause of the poisoning. For example, organophosphate and carbamate poisoning cause very small pinpoint pupils in the victim's eyes. If you or a fellow worker have been working with pesticides and develop unusual or unexplained symptoms, you should give first aid based on information on the label, seek professional help by calling a physician or going to a hospital, or calling a poison control center. First aid for a pesticide spilled on the skin may be to drench the skin and clothing with water, remove contaminated clothing, wash the body with a mild liquid detergent and water, avoid chills and overheating, and or apply a loose, clean, dry covering over any burn. Oil-based pesticides in particular will penetrate the skin readily. Wash these pesticides off the skin as rapidly as possible. First aid for pesticide in the eye is usually to quickly rinse the eye with cool water for 15 minutes or more. First aid for an inhaled pesticide includes getting the victim to fresh air, loosening clothing, and giving artificial respiration if needed. First aid for pesticide in the mouth or swallowed may include rinsing the mouth with plenty of water, drinking up to one quart of milk or water, or inducing vomiting. But vomiting should not be induced if the victim is unconscious, the poison swallowed was corrosive, the pesticide was an EC or oil solution, or the label prohibits inducing vomiting. A method for inducing vomiting is to position the victim kneeling forward and put a finger or the blunt end of a spoon at the back of the victim's throat. Do not use salt solutions to induce vomiting. When going to the doctor or a hospital, take the pesticide label or labeling. Before using any pesticide product, it is important to be familiar with the hazards associated with it how you can protect yourself, and first aid procedures for exposures to that particular pesticide product. Heat stress is the illness where your body is subjected to more heat than it can handle. Heat stress is not caused by pesticides, but it may affect pesticide handlers who are working under hot conditions. Wearing personal protective clothing may increase the risk of heat stress. Signs and symptoms of heat stress may include fatigue, headache, nausea, dizziness and fainting, clammy skin or hot dry skin, heavy sweating or complete lack of sweating, altered behavior. The signs and symptoms of heat stress are similar to those for pesticide poisoning. First aid for either is usually similar. Get the victim into a shaded or cool area. Cool the victim down as rapidly as possible. Sponge, wash, or immerse in cool water. Remove personal protective equipment and clothing. Have the victim drink cool water. Remember, the owner or manager of a business is responsible for making sure employees know how to use pesticide products safely. Okay, chapter six, harmful effects and emergency response. And again, we'll go to the very first paragraph, and in the video, they led this section with the statement, most pesticides are designed to harm or kill pests. That may pop up on the test. The important thing is pesticides are designed to harm or kill pests. We don't want you to harm or kill yourself or your spray partner or harm the environment, et cetera. That's the purpose of this chapter and the preceding chapters. They also talk about the hazard that a uh, 
that a pesticide might pose. And what is that? The hazard, uh, how hazardous a pesticide might be or the hazard that it might pose. That's the risk of harmful effects from using pesticides. The risk of harmful effects from using pesticides will determine the, the hazards. Uh, and what determines then how hazardous a pesticide might be? Um, toxicity and exposure, how hazardous that pesticide might be to your health and well-being. Is the particular toxicity, is it uh, one of the pesticides that's low toxicity with the caution or is it highly toxic? And then of course your particular exposure to it. Did you swallow the pesticide? Did you breathe it? So your particular exposure and then how strong or how toxic that pesticide is will determine how hazardous it is or, or its hazard potential to you. Okay, they talked about the four different types of exposures. I can almost guarantee you you'll see that later today. They're listed up here on page four and we'll talk about those individually. Oral is number one, O-R-A-L, exposure, when you swallow a pesticide. Number two, inhalation, when you breathe a pesticide or inhale a pesticide. Number three, ocular, or when you get a pesticide in your eyes. And number four, the most common one, dermal, D-E-R-M-A-L, dermal, exposure when you get a pesticide on your skin. It says in the book, the most, in most pesticide handling situations, the skin is the part of the body most likely to receive exposure. And that's usually a test question. What part of the body? The skin. We can get it in our eyes, we can swallow it, we might breathe the pesticide, but usually it's a dermal exposure. We don't wear gloves, we're careless, we spill it, we step in it, we spray our feet, but it's exposure to the skin. That's the most common way that we encounter a pesticide. Okay? Uh, what happens if you get a pesticide in your eyes? As far as emergency response, they want you to use an eye flush or an eye kit and just thoroughly wash your eyes out. If you get a pesticide on your skin, you need to wash with soap or water immediately. If you get pesticide all over your shirt, pants, clothing, you need to take that off, wash it, unless you just completely saturate your shirt or pants, then you may just want to just uh, junk it. You may just not even try to wash it. It may not be possible to get it all out. But immediately take a shower or at least wash that pesticide off your skin. As far as swallowing a pesticide, um, you remember in some cases they said do not induce vomiting. That's usually a test question. Do you remember in what cases they, uh, in what situations you don't induce vomiting? Do you remember what they said? If it was a corrosive or an EC, or if it says not to on the label, in some cases you don't want to induce vomiting. As the pesticide comes back, it's already caused 1x amount of damage. When it comes back up, it's going to cause 2x, and it may get in your lungs and shut a lung down and so forth. So be very careful as far as inducing vomiting on certain pesticides, you don't. On others, you can because you want it out of your system and they won't cause that uh, damage as they come back out of your system. Um, acute effects, again, they review that, that are, the acute effects or illnesses are injuries that occur almost immediately. Delayed effects are sometimes called chronic effects and they may not occur for weeks, for days, weeks, or as they said in the video, even years something may pop up, like vision problems or hearing problems or something like that. Then we have allergic effects. Certain uh, people have uh, certain reactions to pesticides like breathing or rash or that sort of thing. Over on page nine, they talk about signs and symptoms of harmful effects. This is kind of like the label and labeling scenario we talked about earlier this morning, you know, a label and labeling signs and symptoms I always thought signs, symptoms, same thing, right? Well, not exactly. Symptoms, there are two types of clues that you can watch for, for a pesticide-related injury or illness. Symptoms, only the person that has been poisoned or affected by the pesticide will know. You might have a stomach ache, you might have a headache, you don't feel well. Unless you tell somebody, then you're the only one that's really gonna know, unless you just snap at somebody. I mean, you know, that, then it would be obvious something may not be right in that personality. But symptoms would, would be clues that only you would know. Signs, everybody's going to know that. Uh, you're going to slur your speech. You're not going to be able to walk straight. You're going to fall down. 
Uh, there's going to be some obvious problems, and it's time then probably to uh, get on over to the hospital or the emergency room. But that's the difference in signs and symptoms. Signs, everybody's going to know that. Vomiting, wobbling, slurred speech, passing out, falling down, et cetera, difficult breathing, quite obvious. Symptoms, only you would, would know that, okay? The best first aid, and this is usually a test question, on page 10 down at the bottom left corner, the best first aid in a pesticide emergency is to stop the source of pesticide exposure as quickly as possible. Put it down, get away from it, stop it. Shut down, get away from it, okay? That's the best first aid, stop the source of pesticide exposure as quickly as possible. Over on page 11, they mention a little bit about heat stress. How many of you have been through a heat stress episode? It's not a lot of fun. I had one when I worked at Callaway Gardens, and we had to suit up and spray the hollies. And we get awfully hot when you spray wax scale or scale, and you put on all of this protective gear, which is actually meant to protect you from the pesticide. But if you're hot-natured to start with, tend to be on the warm side, and you have all the protective gear, you can go overload on the heat, and you go through what we call a heat stress episode. The interesting thing about that is that the signs and symptoms of heat stress are almost identical to that of a pesticide poisoning event. Heat stress is an illness that occurs when your body is subjected to more heat than it can cope with, and that's exactly what happened to me. You just go overload on the heat. And if you didn't know any better, you would think, spraying a pesticide, that you've inhaled a pesticide or you've, got, you've had some type of reaction, when indeed it's not at all. It's nothing to do with the pesticide, it's, it's something to do with the pesticide protective equipment. And you go through heat stress. Some of the signs and symptoms, just like that when using a pesticide. Uh, headache, nausea, dizziness, severe thirst, uh, heavy sweating, you know, collapse and so forth. So, the best first aid for heat stress, get the victim into a shaded or cool area. You want to, of course, get away from the product. Uh, remove any of the protective equipment that you can. Take that off so that you can begin to cool down. Uh, drink a little bit of cool water. Mainly remain calm and so forth, and then usually you will come out of that uh, heat stress episode. But they do make a statement here in the gray block, and anything you see in a gray block is likely to pop up on the test. Severe heat stress or heat stroke is a medical emergency. It's not something you want to play around with. This is serious. It's not something you want to um, um, just play with. You need to do something almost, uh, immediately, as soon as possible, to relieve the heat stress, okay? If we go back over to, do remember the skin being the most common area or part of the body where uh, um, pesticide contamination occurs to the human, it's the skin that most likely will pop up on the test. Terms to know, active ingredients, the chemicals in a pesticide product that actually control the target pest. That's an active ingredient. Every product has an active ingredient and, and sometimes several inactive or inert ingredients. And when you put those two together, you have the pesticide formulation. And then labeling pops up here again, I think for the fifth time. The pesticide product label plus all other accompanying materials are, that contain directions for use of that pesticide. All right, now that we've talked just a little bit about personal protective equipment, let's turn over to chapter seven and we will look at the video portion here entitled Personal Protective Equipment. Personal Protective Equipment. Personal protective equipment is clothing and devices worn to protect the human body from contact with pesticides and pesticide residues. Personal protective equipment includes such items as footwear, goggles, face shields, respirators, aprons, gloves, and head coverings. You are legally required to follow all personal protective equipment instructions that appear on a product's label or labeling. Sometimes requirements differ depending on your activity. For example, more protection may be required when you're mixing and loading than during application. When a label refers to chemical resistant clothing, this usually means items made of rubber, neoprene, plastic, or non-woven fabric covered with plastic. 
cotton, leather, and canvas are considered non-chemical resistant. Some chemical resistant clothing will keep a pesticide from penetrating a fairly long time. Some will not. Thin materials such as disposable plastic gloves, shoe covers, or aprons may be all you need for a task done in a few minutes. Longer jobs will require heavier materials. For example, these neoprene shoe covers will prevent penetration by acetone, a common pesticide solvent, for only 30 minutes. Remember, cotton, canvas, leather, and other absorbent materials are not chemical resistant, even to dry formulations. Do not use hats that have a cloth or leather sweatband. These materials are difficult or impossible to clean once pesticides get on them. Plastic or rubber materials are resistant to dry pesticides and water-based pesticides, such as wettable powders. Those pesticides that are non-water-based, such as emulsifiable concentrates or ultra-low volume concentrates, may have a solvent that will penetrate a chemical-resistant fabric over time. If a plastic or rubber material changes color, becomes soft or spongy, swells or bubbles up, dissolves or becomes like jelly, cracks or gets holes or becomes stiff or brittle, discard the item and choose another type of material. Each layer of clothing and each layer of air between the pesticide and your skin gives added protection. Coveralls made of a sturdy material may be worn over another set of clothing. This may be adequate for some pesticides or the label may require a chemical-resistant suit of rubber or plastic. Wearing a chemical-resistant suit in even moderate temperature and humidity conditions can cause you to become overheated very quickly. Avoid heat stress by using fans, ventilation systems, and shade to reduce heat, taking frequent rest periods to cool off, selecting personal protective equipment that is as cool as possible to wear, such as cooling vests or powered air purifying respirators, drinking plenty of water or sports drinks, and scheduling work during the cooler parts of the day. Pesticide handlers get the most pesticide exposure on their hands and forearms. Protecting your hands and forearms can reduce pesticide exposure up to 98%. This man wore a long sleeve shirt, but no gloves. We introduced a fluorescent dye into the pesticide he was using to illustrate with a black light how much exposure he was getting. You see that his unprotected hands received a great deal of exposure, while his forearms received very little. Wearing gloves is very important to your protection. Wear an apron, goggles, or face shield and gloves whenever you're handling pesticide concentrates. This protects the front of your body and your eyes. Some pesticide labeling requires you to wear chemical resistant footwear. Be sure to wear your pant leg outside your boot. If pesticides get inside your boots or gloves, take them off right away, wash your hands or feet, and put on a clean pair. You should usually place the sleeves outside the gloves to keep pesticides from running down the sleeves and into the gloves. But when you're spraying with your hands raised, you'll need to close the glove cuff tightly outside the sleeve and put heavy duty tape around the end of the glove where it meets the sleeve. If your body will be exposed to pesticides from above, protect your head and neck by a chemical resistant hood or wide brimmed hat. Eyes are very sensitive to the chemicals in some pesticide formulations. When pesticide labeling requires you to wear protective eyewear, goggles or full face shields can be used. Wear protection eyewear whenever labeling indicates eyes need protection. The degree of protection needed will depend on the pesticide being used and the way it's being applied. Mixing and loading toxic pesticides is dangerous because you're working with concentrated materials. Not only vapors and liquid pesticides can be hazardous, but also dusts and wettable powders. Your lungs are much more absorbent than your skin. Even if the label does not require 
respiratory protection, you should have it. If you are applying a pesticide in an enclosed area and the labeling cautions you, do not breathe vapors or spray mist. Or if you will be exposed for a long time and the pesticides are in or near your breathing zone. Dust masks or mist masks held in place by two pairs of straps give protection against dusts, mists, and particles, but not vapors. There are two basic types of respirators that give you protection for dusts and mists, plus gases and vapors. Air supplying respirators, which supply you with clean, uncontaminated air from an independent source, and air purifying respirators, which remove contaminants from the air around you. Use an air supplying respirator when the label tells you to. This is an air supplying respirator needed where the oxygen is low or during fumigation in enclosed areas. In most situations, the air purifying respirator will provide enough protection. It protects you two ways. A pad filters out dusts, mists, and particles, and a cartridge removes gases and vapors. This is a half-face cartridge air purifying respirator. It fits over the nose and allows you to wear goggles if those are needed. Some cartridge air purifying respirators are full face and cover the eyes. Full face styles form to your face and keep a tight seal better than half face styles. Shown here is the canister air purifying respirator, also called a gas mask. It provides longer protection than a cartridge respirator and covers the whole face to include eye protection. Be sure the respirator particle filter, and vapor removing device that you select for a particular job are approved for that purpose by the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, and the Mine Safety and Health Administration. You should replace dust masks, pre-filters, canisters, or cartridges immediately if you have trouble breathing or smell, taste, or feel vapors or warning agents. Even if all devices are working well, you should follow instructions about replacement or replace after eight hours if there are no such instructions. Face sealing respirators must form a tight seal against your face to be effective. Otherwise, pesticides can leak in around the edges. Obstructions such as beards will prevent a tight seal and cause this type of respirator to be ineffective. Before you use a cartridge or canister respirator, have a fit test. Close off the air inlet, inhale gently, and hold your breath for 10 seconds. The face piece should remain slightly collapsed if there is a tight fit. Loose fitting respirators are powered air purifying respirators that pump air through a cartridge or canister into a loose fitting helmet like or hood like head covering. Positive pressure prevents air contaminants from entering the headpiece. This allows easier breathing if you have trouble pulling air through a filtration system. Facial hair is not a problem since a face seal is not needed. And these respirators have the advantage of being cooler to wear. Important when heat stress is a concern. Powered loose fitting respirators are relatively expensive however. Fumigant gases are especially hazardous. Remember these important points. Even small amounts can be fatal. So you must wear the proper type of respirator. Wear it during all exposures and never work alone. When working indoors, an air supplied respirator is necessary. Some protective clothing is intended to be reused and some is disposable. This applicator has on a disposable suit. Disposable suits, footwear, and aprons are designed to be worn only once and then disposed of. They may be made of thin vinyl, latex, or polyethylene, or may be non-woven, including coated non-woven materials. Wash the outside of gloves and boots with a detergent before removing. This helps you avoid contacting contaminated surfaces and helps keep the inside surface uncontaminated. Check clothing, boots, and gloves for cuts, tears, or leaks. 
This slide shows the procedure for washing reusable protective clothing. Handle contaminated clothes with gloves, wash in a washing machine, rinse twice, and run the machine one cycle after removing the clothes to clean out any residues from the tub. Never wash pesticide-exposed clothing with a family wash. Wash separately. Even small amounts of some pesticides may harm small children or others in your family. Hang items outside to dry if possible. Wash goggles, face shields, and respirator bodies and face pieces in hot water and detergent each day of use. In addition, sanitize them by soaking for at least two minutes in a mixture of two tablespoons of chlorine bleach to a gallon of hot water. Dry thoroughly by hand or air dry. Store respirators and eyewear in plastic bags and away from dust, sunlight, extreme temperatures, excessive moisture, and pesticides or other chemicals. If you need protective clothing and equipment, Check your pesticide labels to see what you need for your operation, and then look under safety supplies or safety equipment in the telephone yellow pages. Just as athletes wear protective clothing and equipment for their safety, you need to do the same when handling pesticides. Let's turn over to chapter seven, personal protective equipment. And again, we'll go to the very first paragraph. On the test, if you see the a question that asks PPE, what does that designate? Personal protective equipment. It might also stand for phosphorus potassium equivalent, but we're not talking about fertilizers today. We're talking about pesticides, so don't just be careful about things like that. PPE, personal protective equipment. Um, over on page four, they talk about chemical resistant suits and hoods. Materials that are good for protecting you against uh, pesticides, materials that are not so good, that's usually on the test. The best choice of materials for chemical resistant suits and hoods, etc., would be rubber, plastic, such as butyl, neoprene, PVC. Some of the uh, products or materials not uh, recommended would be uh, canvas, cloth, leather, cotton. They afford very little protection from pesticides. So do remember that, especially with, say, gloves and boots. Uh, if it's not rubber or, or some product like that, then you're not getting very good protection from pesticides. Over on page five, they again mention the fact that the skin is the part of your body that usually gets the most exposure when you're handling pesticides. So that's usually a clue that when these statements pop up from time to time. Also on page six, there's a little statement here, right in the middle column, middle of the column there, middle of the middle column. Chemical resistant suits made of rubber or plastic often are referred to as rain suits. That may pop up on the test, usually it does. The next couple of pages they talk about hand and foot protection uh, with gloves. Pesticide handlers get by far the most pesticide exposure, we've already said on the skin, but particularly what part of the body in the skin. The hands and the forearms, that'll probably be a test question. Hands and forearms, that's usually where you get most of your exposure as far as the skin. As far as glove and sleeve placement when spraying down, where would you want the glove and the sleeve? That's mentioned on page eight. Place sleeves outside the gloves. Now what if you're spraying up, what would you do then? Exactly, otherwise you're gonna funnel everything right back down into your sleeve and you'll essentially wear the pesticide all day. Head and neck protection, a good hat, um, safari type hat with a plastic sweatband or something like that to keep pesticides off of your head, especially if you're spraying uh, slightly up or up above. Shielded safety glasses, keep in mind that reading glasses, driving, uh, Glasses for driving will give you some, very little, however, protection from pesticides. There's just too many avenues here for pesticides. This is not eye protection. This is to drive and read with. Shielded safety glasses or full, or full face shields would be the correct equipment to use to protect your eyes. As far as respirators, 
we could spend again the rest of the day talking about respirators. And when you go back to, to, to go through your uh, sessions for renewal of your hours, then you'll probably go through a session on respirators. But just quickly to mention, there are two basic types of respirators, air supplying respirators and air purifying respirators. The air supplying respirator is a tank usually. It's an independent supply of air or oxygen for you to breathe. Uh, clean, uncontaminated air from an independent source. That's an air supplying respirator. An air purifying respirator in the simplest terms would be a mist mask that you buy at a hardware store or a canister. Normally we think of a canister type respirator and it has the pads or the filters that you need to clean or remove and they discuss that in the video after so many hours and so forth. A fit check, remember they talked about, they had the picture of the gentleman there with the um, respirator, mask, et cetera, but they mentioned that if you have a beard or if you wear glasses and the eyepieces could prevent a, a close contact, snug fit. If you can smell the pesticide, that respirator's not working right. Something's wrong. The filter, this, this needs cleaning. Uh, the filters are bad. The respirator's not working. It's cracked. Something is wrong if you can smell a pesticide and you're using a, that respirator. A, canister type respirator. They talked about washing clothing. If you get pesticides on your clothing, again, if, if you completely saturate, say, your shirt or pants, you need to get that off immediately, change clothes, shower, etc. cetera, uh, then you can wash that clothing if, if you didn't just completely saturate. If you just really, really just soaked yourself, I don't know, um, certainly don't wash that with anything else. No other family member clothing child's clothing or never ever do that but you want to go through the the wash rinse wash rinse wash rinse three cycles to get that pesticide out to be sure that you have the pesticide out so because you don't want to wear a pesticide that gets into the skin it's in contact close contact with the skin that's going to be problems down the road okay if we go back to the beginning of this chapter acute effects almost immediate uh, delayed effects or chronic effects can take a while. Exposure, that's a new term. Coming into contact with a pesticide. It's just simple. Most of this, uh, the word definitions are just simple common sense. Exposure, coming in contact with a pesticide. Residue, the part of a pesticide that remains in the environment for a period of time following application or spill. That's the residue, and some have long residues. Most of those are off the market now. And a new word, diluent or diluent, D-I-L-U-E-N-T, diluent or diluent, anything used to dilute a pesticide. That would be a diluent or diluent. And again, we have the knowledge, or test uh, your knowledge, questions at the end of the chapter, if you wanna take a look at those. We'll now look at chapter eight, Pesticide Handling Decisions, chapter eight is almost a review chapter. So if you just wanna put your books, notes, pencils down and sit back, at this point, the authors of the book uh, and so forth, those that wrote the script and so forth thought maybe we, we should have a review chapter. We've talked about a lot of stuff, so let's go back and recap or review some of this material. So primarily, chapter eight, Pesticide Handling Decisions is a review chapter. But we'll take a look at that. Pesticide Handling Decisions Before you apply a pesticide, there are many decisions that you need to make. You must select the pesticide and the method of application. Consider the environmental conditions that may affect application and determine how you'll deal with them. And decide on the precautions needed to avoid pesticide exposure. Reading the label and material safety data sheet of the pesticides to be considered will help you make the right decisions. A personal safety checklist is also helpful. It should cover these considerations, options for personal protective equipment, steps for proper cleanup after mixing and application, instructions to others who will be handling the pesticide, preparedness for cleanup if there is a spill, and steps for assuring that people and animals are out of the area to be treated. Selecting the wrong pesticide or wrong formulation 
can damage surfaces such as rugs or walls, or as in this slide, a sensitive plant. For example, the label may warn you, do not apply directly to carpet as discoloration may occur, or do not allow spray to contact ferns, hickory, and maples as injury may result. Selecting the wrong pesticide can result in wasted material, failure to control the pest, target site damage, harmful off-site effects, and fines or legal action. Using a pesticide on a crop for which it is not registered will risk illegal residues when the crop is harvested. Effectiveness must also be considered. In making determinations about effectiveness, Conditions at the application site will influence some of your application decisions. For example, soil with high organic matter may tie up pesticides, limiting their activity. Labels may provide you with specific information for your site, such as, in soils over 10% organic matter, use the highest rate given. Foliar sprays may be prevented from entering the leaf by a thick wax or cuticle layer. The waxy surface also tends to cause a spray solution to form droplets and run off the leaves. Typical pesticide labeling statements to alert you to these considerations are add spreader sticker when applying to smooth or waxy surfaces or in difficult wetting situations such as mature waxy foliage, use the higher rate. Low temperatures slow down or stop the activity of some pesticides, just as high temperatures will cause some to break down before there is adequate control. The label may warn you not to apply some pesticides when the temperature is below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, or for others, not when the temperature is above 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Most pesticide applications should not be made during or just before a rain or watering, but with some, this may be desirable. Some soil applied and foliar applied herbicides don't work well without moisture. Air movement can cause pesticides to drift off the target area into sensitive areas that may be damaged you may decide not to spray if the wind is too strong or in the wrong direction. However, in applying ULV for adult mosquitoes, as shown here, mild air movement is essential to carry the spray particles through a city block to get a good kill. Each pesticide application involves a different set of conditions. If you have a choice on the time, early morning or evening may have important advantages because of fewer people around, less wind, no direct sun, less chance of heat stress and volatization. And if applied inside buildings, the ventilation can be turned off if people are not present. Many pesticide handling tasks require that you wear layers of clothing or chemical resistant suits or other protective equipment. While this keeps pesticides off the skin, it also interferes with the body cooling that happens when sweat evaporates from the skin. Again, if you have options, you must decide. Think through the decisions you need to make to not only remove a pest problem, but to do it safely and without damage to your environment. That's pretty much the gist of this chapter. Uh, think through the situation before you uh, take any action. And that's what they're essentially talking about in Pesticide Handling Decisions, Chapter 8. In the very first paragraph, again, before you do any pesticide handling task, you need to make some important decisions. Uh, for instance, they give you this clip art at the beginning of the chapter. It's actually a clipboard, but they have several uh, actions here checked off. Label, is this pesticide labeled for this use? Has it been shown to give good control? Uh, is it safe for me to handle, my employees to handle? Uh, is it safe to the environment? Do I have the right formulation? Do I have the right equipment in good working order? Those are just some of the things that you would need to remember. Um, also in this chapter, there are a couple of items that, that popped up that we'll want to talk about. Drift and rainfall. Remember in an earlier chapter, we talked about drift and drift, the hazards of drift when a 
pesticide could move off site and how that could be a bad thing. Do you remember in this video when drift could actually be a good thing? You remember that when they talked about if you live on if you've ever lived on the coast like I have and you deal with uh, with mosquitoes, uh, you have to have those mosquito units come around, um, or else you won't survive very long down there. But drift to disperse a product such as a mosquito spray could actually be uh, a plus, a beneficial factor uh, in this case. And rainfall, remember how we talked about to monitor rain movement fronts coming in so we didn't wash a product off or flush it and so forth. But in some cases, we would actually need rainfall. Why? To activate a product, usually a granular product. We would want to activate like a pre-emerge or maybe a herbicide product that needs a little water to activate. So in some cases, drift and rainfall uh, are beneficial. In most cases, we uh, not, but in some cases, so. Beginning of this chapter eight, there's a huge block of terms to know at this chapter and the next chapter. Uh, any, everything from adjuvant, diluent, drift, fumigant, heat stress, labeling, leaching, non-target, personal protective equipment, devices and clothing worn to protect the human body from contact with pesticides, residue, the part of a pesticide that remains in the environment for a period of time following application or spill. Now one more at the very bottom, systemic pesticide. That might be a new one for us. Systemic pesticide, I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. A pesticide that has the ability to be absorbed and circulated by the plant or animal, but usually we're talking about plants, so that the plant or animal is actually toxic to the pest. We have certain systemic insecticides, for instance. That's normally when we think of systemics. Again, the test your knowledge at the end of the chapter. You might want to take a look at that. And with that, we'll move over to chapter nine, mixing, loading, and application. This gets into the uh, core of pesticide use, mixing, loading, and application. Chapter nine. Mixing, loading, and application. Handlers who mix and load concentrated pesticides with high acute toxicity have an especially high risk of accidental poisoning. By observing some simple precautions, you can reduce the risks involved in this part of your job. Select a well-ventilated area for mixing pesticides away from unprotected people, animals, food, and other items that might be contaminated. Prevent back siphoning into your water system by keeping the filling hose well above the level of the mix in the tank. Avoid mixing or loading pesticides where a spill, leak, or as shown here, an overflow could get pesticides into water systems. Before opening a pesticide container, you and those you supervise must put on the appropriate personal protective equipment the labeling requires. A bib top apron and face shield or goggles help protect your body from accidental splashes of the concentrated chemical. Do not tear paper or cardboard containers to open them. Use a sharp knife. Clean the knife afterwards and do not use it for any other purposes. When pouring any pesticide, keep the container and pesticide below face level. This will avoid a splash, spill, or dust getting on your face or into your eyes and mouth. To prevent spills, close containers after each use. How do you prepare empty pesticide containers for disposal? Liquid pesticides cling to the inside of the container and can be dangerous to you and other people and the environment. Read the pesticide label for instruction about container disposal. Containers that cannot or should not be rinsed must be emptied as completely as possible. Shake or tap the container carefully to remove as much of the material as possible. You usually can dispose of the emptied containers as solid waste at the sanitary landfill. Rinsable containers should be either triple rinsed or pressure rinsed. Glass, plastic, metal, and even some paper containers can be triple rinsed if water is being used in the mixing process. Let liquid containers drain into the spray tank for 30 seconds, then fill them one-fifth to one-fourth full of water, upend, shake, 
and pour the rinse into the tank. Repeat this procedure for a total of three rinses. Pressure rinsing is an alternative to triple rinsing. Here's a pressure rinse nozzle attached to a water hose and forcefully insert it into the bottom of a metal container. Rotate the nozzle and rinse each container 30 or more seconds. Here are three different examples of pressure rinse nozzles. Plastic containers are punctured through the side. Rotate the nozzle to ensure all the chemical on the sides and inside the handle are flushed out. Remember, containers must be rinsed soon after emptying or the pesticide will dry on the container walls and make later disposal or recycling more difficult. If you are considering combining pesticides in a spray tank, consult labeling, compatibility charts, or other reliable sources. Some pesticides are compatible, some are not, and it's illegal to combine some pesticides. This diagram shows compatible tank-mixed pesticides on the left and incompatible pesticides on the bottom of the right spray tank. Remember, pesticides could physically mix in the spray tank and still be chemically incompatible. You can use a clear glass jar to check the physical compatibility of pesticides. Mark the jar with a poison label so that it will not be later used as a food container. Put the spray components in the jar and see if they'll mix. It is much better to have a small mess in the jar than a big mess in the spray tank. Feel the sides of the jar. If the mixture is giving off heat, it may be undergoing a chemical reaction and the pesticide should not be combined. The mixing order for the quart jar physical compatibility test is, one, add some diluent. Two, then add any wettable and other powders or water dispersible granules. Three, agitate. Four, add the rest of the diluent. Five, add any liquid pesticides. And six, lastly, add emulsifiable concentrates. Shake and check the mixture for heat, 